Today we're going to apply cellulite to different surfaces. We're going to go with paper strip projects on top of uh, masking tape, which would be on top of um, aluminum foil, compacted of course, cellulite on top of other cellulite projects, and cellulite on top of cardboard. This is uh, going to be a tool holder for the table. So different uh, rolls of cardboard that have been cut and glued at different angles. I just noticed this one is loose, but that's not a big problem. I'll hot glue it back together in a moment. And also, I will, I will also show you how to sculpt the cellulite from firm mix over a very simple armature. Let's get started. If you make a foil armature, which this pumpkin is made of, just a big large ball of aluminum foil that I compacted into shape. I use tools like this, for example, to create the grooves in between. Very classic method to make uh, very simple ornaments. And then I covered it in, um, in uh, masking tape to hold the foil together temporarily. Do not trust the tape to be any kind of strength over time. It's just there to help you temporarily. Because tape does lose its adhesiveness over time. Depending on the brand, depending on how old it was and how long it's been on the shelf, how it was exposed to UV rays, etc. This stuff doesn't last. It becomes gooey. It lets go. So keep that in mind when you put that inside your paper mache. I prefer to avoid it if I can. Otherwise, I'll just put a lot of paper on top and uh, forget about it. But I prefer not to use masking tape nowadays. But sometimes I use it because it's convenient. So don't beat yourself up too much if you use it too. It's just my paranoid self who just wants to avoid any possible problem in the future, which is an impossibility, of course, in this world. So let's get started. I have this mix of very firm cellulite. And by the way, I put a surface on my table that's easy to clean. Now, this is some kind of, uh, could be aluminum, it could be steel. I do not know. I recycled it. Um, but it's, it's like foam core, but instead of having paper on top, it's, uh, it's actually a core of plastic and then sheets of metal on, on both sides. So this is that shiny scrap, uh, sh scratch metal look. On the other side, it's white. I don't know what it's called, but if you do, let me know in the comments. I recycled that from the recycling bin of a uh, large format printing company a few years ago. So um, what I do is I restore my, uh, my cellulite clay if it's, if it's been on the counter for a while uncovered is going to develop a little bit of a tiny skin that's semi-dry I don't like that so I just spray it with water and knead it in again now I could start applying it straight away onto the onto the masking tape but I do like to use a bit of wheat paste to reactivate the surface whatever it is like I don't really want to reactivate the masking tape in this case because that's not the kind of glue it has but I still wet it just in case, and it, it just helps cellulite stick to surfaces anyways. So probably all the materials that I'm going to use tonight to show you how to apply the cellulite will all have a little bit of a rubbing of cellulite on top of it. Now, if you keep your cellulite thin enough, it will dry relatively fast, like well, eh, between 8 to, six, 8 to 16 hours in front of a fan. It could be faster depending on your temperature and your moisture levels in your area inside your home especially. So what I do is I always put my paper mache projects, no matter what they are, in front of a fan. I have a really powerful fan that I use at the very, very lowest level of speed just to avoid having a whole lot of waste on energy and also a big obnoxious noise in my apartment. I live in a small apartment, which is also my studio. So I try to, I try to create an environment of peace whenever possible. So again, if I want to add more, I'll just add more paste here. I just don't want to forget a spot. If you do, it's not the end of the world. Uh, everything around it will probably pick up the slack if it ever lifts. But I still want to take that precaution and cover the area with a bit of paste before I add cellulite to a surface. As you can see, my fingers had a bit of, uh, of um, wheat paste on them. And that allows me to smooth the cellulite a lot easier than if I wasn't using any. Sometimes I will use water for this, but it doesn't exactly smooth the same way. So you, you're going to learn, you're going to learn your differences, your preferences. Now with the water, I'm able to do a really nice, really shiny surface pretty quickly. But I'm concerned that if I add too much water, it's going to start peeling 
the cell, you probably won't want to, you know, you won't want to start creating another kind of texture. So don't use too much and don't rub for too long. Just keep moving. I recommend having some kind of stand while you're working so you don't have to hold it in your hands. But I have so many objects here to show you that I, I will not uh, have a specific stand that can hold them all. But yeah, if you don't have a stand, you can still use your hands. It's just a lot more uh, tiresome over time. So yeah, the opportunity of adding cellulite on top of a sculpture like this is not just to add strength and a nice porous surface to apply your primer and then your paint. It's also an opportunity to create more definition. Now, it's easy to do one section, but what if I do a second section here? So one lesson I want you to remember above all else today is anchor first, detail after. And by that I mean make sure that your cellular clay or whatever material that's clay-like is really, really grabbing onto your surface and stays put before you start detailing or pushing it around. You see, it's already lifting. But in a few minutes, the paste will do its job. The cellular clay will firm up a bit. It will stabilize. But even at this stage, you want to you want to really make sure that things are down and that they're going to they're gonna stay there. Wow, makes me sound like a dictator. I don't want to sound like a dictator. Dictate your art, not people. So, um, yeah. Now, you can see the difference between the fresh batch of cellular clay and the one that was smoothed a little bit. This one is a lot rougher. So, again, a little bit of paste or a bit of water. Go like this. I have found out that the paste... Uh, to me, at least, it looks more strong. Like when it dries, the cellulite that's been buffed with the with the with the paste seems to be even harder to the touch. Now, do not confuse hardness with strength. It's just one component of strength. Uh, if something is too hard, it will be brittle upon impact, upon upon any kind of shock. You drop it, you hit it, it will shatter or crack or break or all this. So, don't think that because something is really really firm. That doesn't necessarily make it strong. It's, it's a common mistake. I've done it myself several times. Just test it. You know, do a test piece instead of risking your, your good sculpture, you know, with a new product or a new approach. So you see this? Now, the bumps are, you know, pretty much what they were before. But I can go back with my tools and I can redefine those areas, make them a lot sharper. Now, this would look artificial if I kept it that way. So you can go back and you can roll it or just... You know, just smooth it like this. You could use a brush as well. I have one here. This is a firm synthetic hog's bristle. So this can serve as a finger where your fingers can't reach. And yes, you can use it like sandpaper as well. The more you buff, the smoother and the more even it will be. For something organic like a vegetable, I would not insist too much because I still want that slight unevenness. It creates that um, organic uh, realism that really translates well if you paint if you paint it in a way that emphasizes that it will create the illusion of trans translucency of a skin for example on a bell pepper or human skin so you see that's a lot sharper now and if i decide that there's a weakness in my curves and i want to enhance the, the roundness i can always go back and add more but keep in mind that i think you know the first layer i really recommend keeping it thin if you do, it will dry faster and you'll get to work, you know, a lot earlier. So I can still see a little bit of, uh, of the tape here. That's mean, that means I left it really, 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 really thin. I tried to keep a minimum of, I would say, two millimeters of cellulite clay at a time at least. But the end result should be a, an eighth of an inch thick at least. So I go between metric and inches all the time. I'm Canadian. We depend a lot on... Uh, American products, especially in the construction and fine art industries. So I've had to adapt to both. So yeah, in, in Imperial, I would say an eighth of an inch at least. A uh, quarter of an inch is my favorite you know, measurement for that sort of thing. I don't know what the exact <laughs> equivalents are between them. I know that sounds weird, but I don't. I just have to look it up on the ruler again. And uh, I don't have one right now. And I don't want to stand up because my setup is good, I think. So look it up. <laughs> so anyways, at least two millimeters and, you know, for, at least for the first layer, it, it will dry faster if it's thinner, but I still want to structure when I'm done. So probably what, whatever the equivalent of an eighth of an inch thick is in, um, 
in metric is what I would recommend to apply as a first coat. And at, at your last, um, you know, in your final results, it should be like a quarter, a quarter inch thick because it will be stronger that way. And I don't just say that for clay. I mean, any paper clay-like product, any product of paper that behaves like clay, I would say, is not as strong as paper strips. So to compensate for that, you got to go thicker. Or you got to combine it with a paper strip project, which is my preference. I make my big masks out of paper strips. Big, I mean full head and or shoulder shoulder masks out of paper strips until the strips themselves are strong, that they hold everything in place, that it's stable. Then I can add cellulite or paper pulp on top of it for different types of texturing. Like I could do the whole thing in cellulite, which is what I did for my living mountain project, the the big landscape with a face that I showed that I showed in the in the first episode. That guy is entirely covered in cellulite. It, it did add a lot of weight, but since it's a shoulder mask, that was absolutely not an issue. I actually wore that at the last product protest I went to uh, last fall, and I, I wore it for three hours. So it was uh, definitely doable. But most of the time for large masks, I, I use cellulite mostly as specific textures in some spots, and... Uh, the rest might be done with paint so that I keep it much more lightweight than it would be otherwise. So you just saw me cover three sections of this pumpkin. I think you get the message. Again, you can uh, smooth this with the paste. I find that it's easier and faster with the paste. Just insist a bit and it's going to get more buffed and more shiny when it's done. And I think that the paste is lending extra strength to the surface at least of the cellulite. clay. If it's not strength, at least it's firmness, which allows me to buff it even shinier later. Because yes, wheat paste can be sanded when it's dry. It's one of its biggest advantages besides strength. Once again, I can go back with the tool. By the way, if you're going to make a, a pumpkin, I recommend you get a pumpkin from the store, if it's in season, of course, and study what kind of shapes they have. Like right now, I did the, the, the line definition, and I went back with my finger to buff it out again. I can go back with the brush because my finger was not reaching fully. I can leave some of that line there. I don't want it to be too sharp, but and I can make it uneven. I can st stamp it here. I can buff it here. It will it'll just end up looking more natural. Sometimes you see a spot that's really interesting, uh, an uneven uh, area, and you might want to emphasize that, and that might translate like some kind of rot or a dry spot or any other kind of uh, condition you might have on a real pumpkin. So look at the real objects whenever possible. So that's how I would uh, I would proceed with um, cellulite clay on top of masking tape. Now normally I would not be holding this like this. I would hang this somewhere in front of a fan so it dries for at least eight hours but it's probably going to be like 16, 16 before I add more to it. I'm going to hold this as a second example. This is an area I did on a previous attempt at filming this. And yes, filming sometimes fails, so you have to start over. Now this is fully dry, even though I did not use the heat box. It's been a week, so a week with, without even using a fan. And it was so thin that it still dried fully, I can tell. So once again, on top of cellulite, I want to add a bit of paste to reactivate the stickiness of cellulite clay and to prevent to prevent them from ever separating. You could use water, the same thing, but I prefer to paste. Don't know why I just prefer to paste. I usually have paste anyway, so why not use it? So now, why would I add more to define it better? I probably should add more overall, so I don't forget a spot. Because I will be finishing this at some point, maybe during the filming of this series. I do not know. I tend to. Um, like an art bee, I tend to, I tend to go from flower to flower, from project to project to show you all the possibilities. I don't have a script for this. I just decide the day I'm filming what I'm going to show you to fulfill the list of steps that I was planning to show you. So there you go. We got that bump now a lot more um, affirmative, and we can do that everywhere. We're talking nostrils here. I want them to 
push out a bit more. Now, I could either add or I could carve out, but I can't really carve out unless I want to sacrifice the stability underneath. So in this case, I'll just add more. And you can go with tiny coils or little balls. I like the idea of coils because they tend to make my shapes look more natural, like they grew that way. But of course, once it's anchored, I, I will keep repeating this today, anchor first, detail after. So once it's anchored, you can pinch it like I just did, although that does not look like something that grew this way, unless you're talking insects. But um, you can then round it off a little bit. And you can use your tools, of course, my favorite being the spatula, which is uh, often used in, as a dental tool, but it's a classic in clay sculpting. So that, that's good. Let's add a bit more paste for the other nostril. I'm going to show you a whole lot of the same thing on different surfaces. It will get into your brain better. Repetition helps in these cases. Unlike music, when they repeat too much, which drives you insane. At least it did me. Like, where's my sanity? I don't know. I think I left it somewhere. I think I ran away from the music. Yeah, the sanity stayed there. So there you go. These nostrils are looking absolutely grotesque, and I love it for a Halloween bobble, something that hangs in your window or on your Halloween tree. That's not a thing, but it should be. So there you go. You want some? Uh, I want some roundness, roundness in the lips. I'll definitely go back and add more to that. One side is more um, luscious than the other. So might as well either emphasize that and make the, the luscious side even more plump and, uh, you know, love in life. And the other one could stay more flat. By the way, this is a good time when your celery clay is dry to go back with a bit of paste or water. And water will go a bit faster because it will re-moisten the celery clay faster. But the paste will give you more uh, time to adjust. Now, normally before I do this, I carve out or sand out the spikes I don't like, but I didn't this time, which is not a problem because I could just add more celery clay on top of it. But I mentioned buffing because that's a good way for your final, final layer to go back, or even right now if I wanted to find it better or get rid of some of the tiniest bumps while, without killing them completely. You can actually affect just the surface of it if you don't do it for too long. So that's a good tip for detailing, but we're going to have an episode on that in the future. So in this case, I'm just going to add more celery clay there because we do need, like I said, a minimum thickness to create a nice, durable, strong surface. I like my objects to be strong enough that if I throw them, and I do mean throwing at a wall, it will bounce back and the wall might have a dent, but the object will not. So of course, don't do that. Respect your art. But um, if you make a test piece to impress people, Make a ball, make something that doesn't have a face. Maybe it does, maybe it likes being hit, like maybe it's a weird character. But don't do that on something you want to respect or you want people to respect. I had that speech from a colleague in the puppetry business. Because I used to carry my art in garbage bags when I didn't have space enough in my backpack. And I, when, I, when I took out some of my pieces, he was scandalized. Like, this is not garbage, it's your art. If you don't believe in it, how can you perform it well? And he had a point. He had a good point. So respect your art, even if only if you pretend to respect it so that other people will respect it <laughs> at minimum, even if you don't feel it. Maybe you'll start feeling it after a while, but always respect you know, your art and that of others. Don't carry them in garbage bags. One of my colleagues told me that he lost a bunch of puppets during a move because some helpful person thought it was garbage and they threw it away. He didn't put a label on it. Maybe he had a little sheet or something, but they probably did not notice. So while they were moving stuff away, somebody was probably being very helpful and they threw that in the garbage bin because they never found them again. So for that's another reason not to carry your stuff in a garbage bag and also not to throw it at things unless, again, it's a test piece and you just want to show off. But don't do that on your nice puppets, on your even on your prototypes. Like they have, They have a life that you gave them. Anyways, that cheek is now existing when it was not there before. I'm not actually showing you the full uh, sculpting method yet, but this is part of it. So adding little lumps, anchoring them, 
pushing them around. I'm going a bit fast, but in a moment, once I'm done showing you on different surfaces, I'll go back and show you how I sculpt celluclate in the mass. There you go. And in the mass, I mean in the thickness of things. Like right now, I'm just adding a little layers at a time, and that's part of it. But I want you to see that you can actually sculpt and dump of celluclate. As long as you have a bit of an armature inside, but I'll explain that later. Remember, anchor first, detail after. Push it around, texture it, create lines, create scars, and yes, you can do elephant skin with what Don Lanning would call the power of the X. Check out his videos on uh, online where he's teaching about you know sculpting with clay. Don Lanning, look him up. I had a lot of fun watching that video. He actually did a few with another website called the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. I, I couldn't remember before, but check him out. I like to cross-reference different sources of uh, instructions because we can all benefit from learning from different uh, levels of expertise and different fields, especially. So yeah, this is uh, already looking like it's got a lot of personality and I'm gonna stop myself, even though I'm enjoying myself quite a bit. Um, I'm gonna stop and uh, show you on another object. Here's a piece of wood. Now, this is a sculpture I started with a little uh, craft knife, something like this. I don't think I used a gouge on this one. I used a bit of sandpaper, maybe a file, and a bit of a wood-burning tool for uh, emphasizing the details. The problem is this piece of wood I was using had the hole on the side, and I didn't want to keep it there. I said at some point, I'm going to just fix it with some cellular clay. So that's what I'm going to do now. Because yes, you can use cellular clay as a wood putty. It's not going to be the same texture, and it's not going to see the, be the same color. So keep that in mind. It will dry differently. But you can squish it in the hole. I would say insist a little bit, so it's a little bit thicker than just a flimsy sheet. And then when that's dry, leave it a bit prone. Leave it a little bit above the surface, a bit, a bit thicker than where it should be. That way, you'll have space to sand it off. I actually like to patch it a bit wider than the area, just like patching a hole in a gypsum wall, gypsum uh, sheeting wall. You want to make a larger patch so you can fade it better. And as it shrinks, it will shrink as it dries. As it dries uh, and shrinks, uh, it will get a bit closer to the surface, and then you just sand it off. Once again, a bit of paste around the hole, maybe not inside, because it will be hard to dry. And you want to squish it in. Like I should have used a tool for that earlier but as you can see it's very forgiving it will uh it will work if i have to do a second application i will but i usually don't have to so patching those holes will certainly help with my overall look another thing i can do to it again adding a bit of just a tiny amount of uh, wheat paste or water you can add ears this guy needs ears and i ran out of wood because <laughs> it was a stock piece of wood. So, yeah, I just was trying a sculpture, uh, an, a, an attempt at a, at, a, at, a, at a step I wanted to I wanted to try. I can't speak today, but it's okay. Let's forgive ourselves our lack of efficiency sometimes. All right. Uh, this one is resisting me a bit, so I'm going to add a little bit more paste. Anchor first, detail after. So you'll see this. My ears look like big lumps right now, but at least I know they'll stay put. So maybe I'll even want to wait a few minutes, five minutes before I start shaping, but I usually don't. <laughs> I'm not a patient person by nature, but uh, with time, you can develop it. So right now I'm pushing in there. I can lubricate my tool with a bit of paste. I said a bit, not a lot. Maybe I'll put it here. And I'll squish my tool in there to create a little bit of an ear detailing then i can go and smear around the excess really blend it with the wood once you're done one when, when is dry you can go back with files especially diamond coated files to really sharpen those edges and it will look like the rest of the thing it will look carved once you paint it nobody can tell if it's been shaped or carved you can of course blend the edges a bit by buffing with the tool that has a bit of paste on it. 
And later on, if I really am working on something this small, and maybe if I'm working on several at a time, I will um, I will go back when it's firmed up a bit to detail it better. Like behind the ears right now, it's ridiculously um, filled in. So at this point, I could carefully squish down and press away, smooth it away like this. Or I could wait for it to dry and carve it out, which, you know, I prefer to do a bit of both. Like right now, I went and defined it a bit more. I'm noticing those ears are way too forward on the cheeks. But that's a problem. Let's bring them back. You can make them pointy if you want. Because I anchored them, they're easier to move around without sh shredding, them, shredding them out. But as you can see, there's a fold behind that became like an air pocket. So fold it back in. Same thing here. This clay is really firm, but it could actually be firmer. So again, I would leave it there for a few minutes while I work on something else. Maybe I'll do the dishes. <laughs> when I'm done, I can come back and shape it a bit better, a bit harder. I mean, when it's a bit firmer, I can do better sharp edges. But all of it, once again, I made it too close. So I have that tendency, so keep that in mind. Yeah. Now, I don't want those ears to just be flat. I want them to stick out a bit so they are able to hear what comes from the front. So yes, you can complete the wood sculpture with celluclay should your sculpting skills not be, your carving skills not be as good as your clay shaping skills. I'm, I'm lacking a bit of clay here, so more celluclay over the celluclay that's already there. I'm trying to go fast here and that reduces my precision, but I have a lot to show you today, so. My hands are full of um, lumps of celery clay, so sometimes you want to wet them again, either with paste or water. I prefer to have a bucket of water next to me with a textured rag in it. And of course, I forgot to prepare that before I filmed. So I will go get some in a few minutes between the sequences. There you go. This guy has ears, and of course, forgot one side that needed to have a bit of a depth to it. You can use a rounded tool for this. I like to use a, a shortened and rounded knitting needle. This one was sharper than it is now because I sanded it off. My ears don't have to be perfect at this point. When, they're, when the structure of them is dry and firm, they will be easy to uh, make them sharper. I could even dig in there with a power tool or with a knife. It certainly will dull your knife blades, so don't use your favorite wood carving gouges for this. But um, you could if you want, but you better be good at buffing them again and make them shiny. You know, honing it's called. So since I'm not that good at it, I tend not to use uh, gouges on my cellular clay when it's dry. I use them on my monster clay, however, because it doesn't seem to dull them as much. So I would like his nose to stand out a bit more as well. So his there, I don't know yet. Let's rub that until it's no longer um, slimy. Then add a bit of celery clay to it. So I want him to have a longer point, but I want it to anchor really well. So going to spread that cellular around on the other parts blend those shapes anchor first detail after first i make sure the edges and maybe the, even the center of the lump are touching the wood everywhere then i can go back and shape them without fear of them separating as they dry because that can happen See, right now it's still very soft i'm gonna lubricate a bit with the paste. You can buff as well if you, if you want at this point. If you buff now, you won't have to buff as much later. But some, yeah, I usually prefer to 
wait until the clay has stabilized before I do a lot of that fine, fine detailing. And yes, you can buff and detail at the same time. The buffing can provide you with details. Now his nose is sticking out when it wasn't before. And you can change the personality or the type of character depending on how you make the nose. Point up, down, sideways. I love diversity. I love trying different things. I love a big nose because they're very expressive. And this is the kind of nose that was, I had in mind. But I do need the tip to be a little bit triangular. A little bit. I like the way that it creates a, a sharper highlight on top. Yeah! This may turn into a goblin or you know, some, some kind of other fantasy creature. Now, I could create arms and probably will eventually. Probably starting with an armature, maybe some foil. Or I could do the whole thing in celluclate, but it would take a while if I made it solid celluclate. But if I use the size of the wood as the armature, and I keep my arms to the body instead of sticking out, then I could probably, let's experiment a bit. I can probably just put that on. This was not planned, by the way, but anchor first. Detail. After. Now, created shoulders. Now, this could just be a bust. I like the look of a, a small bust like this. You could put that anywhere on your desk, even if you have a limited space. Miniature busts. They're all the rage. All right. And you have a fa if you have a family of borrowers in your dwelling or at your office, then maybe they can borrow it and have a, an art gallery with your art as the main feature. Yeah. For them, it's going to be a large-sized bust, maybe even a life-size bust. Think about that. Think about them for a change. All right, so this this would take a bit of time, a lot more time to dry, considering those shoulders are very thick. But here's what you can do to help them dry faster. Now, you could use a, you should use a much finer tool than this. So I'm going to go get, I mean, you don't have to. You could use this. You could create a few holes in the mass, at least for the first application like this. And this will allow the moisture in the celluclate to escape faster when the fan is blowing at it. Because of course the wind will be able to suck it out faster. Now it looks like garbage, <laughs> but this will be easy to patch up later when you start applying the detail coat of the same material. I usually use a pin for this so it doesn't disturb my surface so much. And or, usually it's an and, I wait a bit longer. I let that dry overnight before I poke holes in it so that the surface is firm and more stable. Then I'll use a tiny pin, and I do mean a T-pin for sewing like this. T-pin. Over here. These are really practical. I use them a lot in assembly work, in my puppet work, and sometimes accessorizing my masks and stuff like that. So you could poke those tiny, tiny holes all over the cellu clay to allow the moisture to escape faster. It will save you, it will shave off hours of drying time if you do this. Now, even in the in those tiny ears, I don't need to do that. But sometimes I still do like the very fleshy bits of it. If only like a few holes. Again, so I don't have to wait too much for it to do its job. But yeah, the T pinhole, uh, the, the, the pinhole uh, technique was t told me by, by someone. I can't remember who it was, but that was years ago, and I've been using it ever since. Now, I already dusted this yesterday, and I, whatever needs to be done is covering it in the clay to reinforce those structures and create a texture, too. So that's a tool holder, as I mentioned before. Uh, I could use my hands and apply the weak paste everywhere. By the way, there's a little bit of a weakness here. That's okay. Cellular clay would take care of that. But I prefer to use a brush for this because I can reach everywhere. Everywhere I need to. If I'm going to work mostly in the front, I'm just going to paste the front. This is fun. Now, this guy should have been glued back before now, but Let's use this as an opportunity to see how strong it can be with celluloid added on top as the main adhesive to anchor it with the base. Hence the importance of using the wheat paste as that bonding layer. 
That's what I believe is, it's called at this point. I don't need to go inside and put CelluClean in there if I don't want to. I will actually for some of them because they, there's gaps between them and the, and the outside. But the primer will take care of stabilizing the insides. This one, however, being easy to reach, will be covered in CelluClean on the inside. The other ones, possibly, pro probably not. But you could do that if you decide to. The weed paste will... Um, Add a bit of strength too. Now you could actually let this dry. You could paint the whole thing in wheat paste and let it dry and then do it do that again and just apply silly clay while the wheat, the second coat of wheat paste is um is moist. Why would you do that? Well you might need some stability um for something that's a bit more flimsy, for example. This is not flimsy, this is really thick cardboard tubing from bolts of fabric, I believe. I save what I can. If I buy a lot of fabric, I'll ask for the bolt so I can carry it easier and sometimes store it easier. Anyways, let's put that here and let's cover. Let's zoom you out a bit. Let's start covering this cardboard with clay Now, anchor first, detail after is what we said. So let's, let's keep doing that. I'm going to anchor this loose piece of cardboard to the base by adding little lumps at a time. What I'm trying to do with this piece, which is a tool holder, is to make it look like it grew that way. Once again, this time I'm really anchoring something to the base. I wanted this to really not move around anymore. Ideally, normally I would use a bit of hot glue because it's fast, but I wanted to see, this is me being curious right now, I want to see how strong strongly the cellulite can make this cardboard tube stick to this plywood scrap base. So I'm, I'm anchoring it on the outside. Don't forget that I put wheat paste inside and out of this piece earlier. And there's a bit of hot glue here. And I wanna, there you go. So now this thing is really not moving anywhere. It's grabbed onto from the outside and from the inside. If I want to make it even more stable, I'll just add a little bit more in the center to make sure the whole surface inside this tube in particular is coated in a thin coat of silly clay. And where the corners are concerned, where the cardboard is meeting the, um, the plywood, they, they, they don't have a gap. I'll do the same thing in this gap in the center here. See that space? I want to make sure that these areas are properly reinforced. I don't ever want this thing to fall apart. So if I keep it, then I want it to be super strong for my tools. If I don't keep it, I still want it to be super strong for whoever else's tools. If I sell this, if I give it away. Now I just, when I, when I made this one, I went into a frenzy of creating useful items and I did not complete them all. So in fact, around the same time as when I made this one, which I did finish. This is a little bonus for you. This was a scrap piece from the building of this this work table. The, the, the carpenter I hired gave me the scraps. So I turned this into a tool holder that has an angle to it. That was one scrap of pine. This is a scrap of red cedar. I stained them with the same wood stain. I did not even bother varnishing it. But someday I'll think it's, when, it, when I think it looks messy enough, I will actually varnish it. To preserve the, the studio look and give it more of a, a deeper color but um yeah so when i discovered i could do this i let that one go in the box of unfinished things but now i'm looking at it again and i'm thinking it would be a good idea to finish it so you'll get to see that happen once again i use a tool wherever my fingers can't reach you might want to think about what this is like where the those junction junctions are happening if you don't want to spend hours smoothing them until it's seamless you might want to think that oh this is soil that's grabbing like this this is old structures coming from the ground and there's been some soil accumulation or some moss you, you decide what it is to you when you do it for me i'm just gonna go for now just anchoring these pieces together later on i'll think about what the junctions look like but if i were to think of it now i might save myself some trouble later 
just have a lot of things to think about for the, while I'm filming, so I'm going to simplify my life. And there's a space between the two tubes. I don't need to uh, fill the gap, but I probably will. It will help prevent accumulation of varnish in that area. That always happens when you use a thick varnish. When I use a thick varnish, I don't know about you. Always think about diluting your varnish if you, if the instructions tell you that it's a good idea, and follow those instructions to use the proper type of solvent. If it's water-based, water will do. If it's, um, in case of doubt, use distilled water, because you don't know sometimes what's in the tap water. And over, it might be temporarily contaminated. I love tap water. I drink tap water. But if it's your art and you don't want to take a chance, distilled water usually serves. In fact, it's great for diluting latex, like real rubber latex. If you try to dilute rubber latex with tap water, often it will have things in the water that makes it not the same pH. I think it's a pH thing. But distilled water works fine. It does not make the latex coagulate like my tap water does. So there you go. I'm, I'm filling the gaps between the tubes. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'm just demonstrating for you that it can anchor things together. The main thing I wanted to show you was to I just remember that I did paste it. So I'm going to go straight with this. So you clean out. I want to make a, a tiny skin of it. I can use my fingers. If I were to do a, a big quantity, I might want to use um, a rolling pin. If you don't have a rolling pin, you can use a glass bottle. If you want your sheets to be all the same thickness all over, you might want to use two identical pieces of something. For example, two uh, strips of wood, um, paint stirring sticks, for example. Put them on both sides of your, of your clay. And then when you roll, the clay will end up being the same thickness as those two spacers that you used. That's a classic tip, very useful. I usually don't bother with these kinds of projects but I know I can use it if I need it. Like I'm gonna keep that really, really organic. I might decide that these are not human made after all. These might be tree trunks, because I'm really into that kind of texture. So I could go and texture that as I go with my spatula. I've seen really good um, sculpted bark texture done with, sorry, you couldn't see that before, done with, um, a fork, but it was a much larger sculpture, so you probably want to use a rake for that, a sculpting rake. So I'm applying this, and I'm going to decide as I go, is this going to be a tree trunk, or are these going to be pipes sticking out of the ground? Uh, my tendency is when, I, when, when I'm in charge of the idea, when I'm not under commission for someone else, my tendency is to go with natural textures. So I'm going to do this now. I'm going to coat this whole pipe with cellulite. And I might even, I will change the volume a bit. Like, eventually you want some roots to stick out a little bit. So I, I put that little pinch here. Anchor first, detail later. So I'm anchoring some clay in here. I'll come back and score it after. Now the cardboard itself is really strong already. Cellulite clay will add to that strength. But I don't need to add a huge quantity of it to get a durable result, especially considering I am always going to seal my paper mache projects before I paint them to ensure that they last. So sealing should be done with a proper sealer, something that will really prevent water damage and moisture from the air damage, type of damage. So this could be your first application. You could stop right here and go back and do the organic detailing later. But I do like to give it a certain direction. So I'm seeing some of the lines that I applied with my hands are suggesting a certain direction for my for my bark. So I'm gonna use those lines. Why not? Instead of having to rethink of it, get inspired by what you see. And that, what, that will help you, I think, um, at least it does help me stick to something that looks a little bit more random. And I want some of those, uh, the older bark on an older tree where the bark is sticking out a little bit so I go back and I lift a little bit of it if I want to or I can 
create that lift effect later when I go back. Once this is dry or semi-dry, I prefer to wait until it's really dry before I add more. Yeah, it, this stick would not finish like perfectly smooth, but as a designer, you decide, you decide if you're gonna leave it that way. I personally, normally, would prefer to finish the edge as if it was a hollow log, so slightly uneven surface, some pieces sticking out. Since this is supposed to be a tool holder, I probably don't want any super fine things sticking out because they will break off over time. So maybe just make the edge a little bit uneven and maybe even create a bit of texture on the inside, a little bit at the you know beginning to help sell the idea that this was a natural object that was turned into a tool holder. So yes, you can work straight up on cardboard, especially the thicker stuff. You could technically work on uh, toilet paper rolls if they have not been to the bathroom. I buy a package specifically for art making and uh, it creates a very interesting pulp. It's not nowhere near as strong as study clay, so I don't use it as much. But for some larger projects, for some specific types of textures, I, I will make a, a batch of uh, toilet paper pulp. But yeah, that's how, that's how I would proceed with covering a cardboard structure with celluloid. The cardboard was held together with high temperature hot glue and held on top of a base. I normally would not use cardboard for whatever touches the table or the floor or whatever. I would use something sturdy, stable, and heavy for the base. And normally that's plywood, a thickness or two or three or four. But sometimes I'll even glue some stones in there or bricks if they're clean to... Um, create extra weight where I need it. For puppets, I don't usually add weights for bigger bigger ones, but for uh, display pieces, a bit of weight uh, certainly helps stabilize them, especially if they're very vertical sculptures. It will make them bottom heavy for stability, but it also feels like they're more valuable for some people. I don't know why, but a heavy sculpture seems more valuable than a, than a lightweight one. Let's get ready for the direct sculpting approach even though i've already demonstrated all the steps on those various objects i will now do this on a specific piece that i'm going to uh, hold for the sake of efficiency i'm going to recycle this old sculpture as a temporary armature to show you my or maybe the permanent armature um to show you the the sculpting method using clay. so once again i would i would either use a wheat paste or water to help sell your clay stick to the wood. Now this is the same piece of wood as before, just because it was there. <laughs> I could have gone and prepared a piece, but it's too late at night. I don't want to disturb the neighbors by using the bandsaw. This is not a commercial space. So the uh, armature, normally I would round this off because those sharp edges could get in the way of my sculpting. I would also make sure to draw something on paper or something stable like that full size, the final size and the final look of what I'm looking for. If I am not just improvising, if I'm under commission and the customer wants something specific, I'll sketch in advance usually. So uh, not always, sometimes they wanna, they wanna see what I do. <laughs> but if you have a sketch, a full sized, final sized sketch, you can use it constantly to see, first of all, the size of your armature. You don't wanna make it too big because then you won't be able to dig in if you need to. So choose the size of your armature based on what your final size will be. For example, you want to put some eyes into the sculpture. If you use that armature this way, with the whole flat surface in front of you, then you're limiting yourself to how deep you can make those eyes, unless you decide to carve into it, which is totally feasible. But if you don't want to carve into it and you're still using wood, you might want to use it as a diagonal like this. And that's a classic method. Actually, this notch in here was how I was quickly explaining to someone else a while ago that that specific type of um, folk carving method where you draw the profile on the corner of a square piece. And I was showing how you do the underside cut, you know, under the nose. So yeah, you can use this uh, diagonal here as a depth where you can put your eyes instead of being stuck to that plane. Now you have two planes to, to play with. So anchor first, detail later. You might actually draw on your wood before you put the paste or the water on it. 
if you want some indications, but right now I'm just going to improvise something for you. It's, ner it's nerve-wracking and exciting at the same time. Because I did not plan this specifically as a character. So we shall see. So first I want to put a head size. I want to decide how big I make this approximately. I'll take I put paste on this side. Oh, I did actually. Good. And I want to lose that square effect. Again, I could have rounded this off, but I don't intend to keep this sculpture unless I fall in love with it as I work, which does happen. So we'll see. Anchor first, detail later. So we want that clay to stay put. We want to press it down really well. Sometimes I'll start with just tiny, tiny pieces to make sure that every piece is sticking to the wood instead of a large blob that might actually lift. So tiny pieces. I might have a square-faced, you know, square-headed character. Nice mix of uh, organic and uh, manufactured look. Probably don't want any of the wood to show because they are in my way as I sculpt. So might as well add a bit more clay. Pinch it to emphasize that squareness. Isn't that melodic? So we got beginning here. This is a good skill to have. You um, improvise with whatever's happening. Feel, try to feel comfortable not knowing, com not you know, comfortable in the unknown, in the, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm trying to do something cool, but I try not to care while I'm doing it. I try to have fun. It's still caring, but in a different way. I care about having fun. I care, I care about discovering what this will become. And that seems to be my best attitude for when I'm creating things for myself, but also for customers. If they let me if they give me that freedom. Now I got this big nose thing. I don't know if it's a nose yet. Could be a chin. I really don't know. Now I could indicate where the eyes are. How about giving him or her or them this beautiful big exaggeration of eyes. Now they're going to look really rough. I'm pressing my tool into the celly clay. And it's a messy mush right now. But as we work, it's going to firm up quite a bit. And you can go back and round that eyeball, which I'm doing now, actually. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But, and they don't have to be the same size. You can be comfortable with asymmetry. That's another thing. If you stretch your comfort zones, you'll be discovering more. You might find a new friend in someone that you might not even have approached in the, in the past because you thought they might look a bit scary or unusual. That's stretching your comfort zone. Same thing with art supplies. Like, oh, oil paint looks really difficult. I better not try because I could fail. Well, it's the same thing with watercolors. It's the same thing with paper mache. It's all about attitude. So I got this nose. I got these eyes. Let's look at it closer. Let's zoom in a little bit. Now you can see a lot better. Thanks for asking. So <laughs> I heard that voice in my head like, hey, you might want to zoom in. So I did. It's probably one of you. Thank you. All right. Time does not exist. It's a concept. All right. So if you said so in the future, I was still able to hear it. Magic. Now I would like that. I would like this thing to have lips, but maybe tiny, tiny lips. Like you give them attitude. I can just stick a stick a bit here. See, that's already got a little bit of attitude, a little bit of personality. And I wasn't planning that little dip in there, but I like it. So I'll keep it. See, it's, it's improv. You say yes and if you've never looked that up, if you never performed that improv or even tried just for fun, uh, it's, an, it's a whole thing. You go, when someone suggests something, when they say something like, so are we going inside the black mine? And you might reply, if you're going to go with the and, yes and, you might go, yeah, let's go or... Uh, Okay, let's go, because if you say no, then maybe you just stopped a, a really interesting scene to hap from happening. If you say yes, and you can add something to it. Sure, but um, let's get a weapon first. <laughs> I don't know what's in there. But if you don't know that rule, and you don't, or if you know it and you don't apply it uh, for some reason, then you might block. 
you know, you might be blocking the whole thing. So I, I do the same when I'm sculpting. I, what texture I'm, I'm having here with all these little lumps on top of each other, they're suggesting something to me. And I might say yes, and I might say and, yes and, or I might say no. In this case, I have more freedom because I'm not performing with someone else on stage. But sometimes it's fun to collaborate with different artists. Think about that as well. So I got this little bump here. Could that be the beginning of tiny, tiny arms? This time, really thinking about that structure on the arms. You'll notice I'm only using my fingers right now because I want to keep it rough. This could become a little idle figurine inspired by old artifacts that might be found by architects, especially fictional architects in movies. I'm all about the fantasy aspect, science fiction aspect, stuff like that. Like I have a whole lot of grabbing here, that extra wood here. I, I, I always recommend to have a bit more and cut it off when the thing is mostly done. So the whole time you're working, you have some good grabbing power. You can install this on a base without damaging your sculpture, stuff like that. So that little bump here suggests a belly to me. So why not get that a bit more paste, spread it around. But if this was a puppet head, I would do the very same thing. I would be maybe starting from a sketch, maybe not. It depends on the project. I'm comfortable with either way. I love drawing. I love designing on paper. But there are certain things that are much easier for me to just go straight to the clay. I could actually do a sketch in a water-based or preferably a, an oil-based clay for something small like this because it doesn't dry out. It doesn't get messy. And you can put it away and use it again a few days later, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, which is hardly ever the possibility for me because my customers want their stuff right away. But I do have some personal projects that have been on the shelf for years. So anyways, I would do a quick sketch in uh, Monster Clay. That's my favorite brand for now. I've used it for at least six years now. And I love it. That stuff, you can do a quick sketch with it if it's warm. If you heat it up, I, I use a crock pot for that. And then when I know what I'm doing, I can use that as a model to reproduce it in whatever final product I need. In this case, if I wanted to make it a paper mache sculpture, I would just have the model right next to me. It would help me decide the size and shape of my armature. It would help me detail it as much as I want. Because clay, you know, regular clay, regular sculpting clay will allow you to add and remove a lot better, a lot faster than waiting for the paper mache to dry and then having to carve it out. So that's why doing a, doing a sketch initially in clay might be a really, it might feel like you're wasting your time at first, but in the end result, you could be, it could become a time saver. So I got this little belly effect here going. I like it a lot. Maybe he's got a pouch and his hands are in it. Don't know. That's that's whole attitude. Like maybe it is, maybe it's not. I just haven't decided yet. So I'm covering the surface of my armature with cellulose clay, and you'll notice I'm working relatively thin, like an eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch. But as I go, I can add more. I've seen people work much thicker than this with cellulose clay and similar products, and they're fine. They just take forever to dry. So keep that in mind. I want that bump on the nose when I made it too big. So I'm going to anchor first. Maybe pinch some of it out later or right away, depending. Maybe he's got those bumps on the head like a dragon would have. A lot of dragons have that in the design of part of them. But this roughness level, if you're comfortable with it, that's awesome. If you're not, get comfortable with it. Because those lines, those scratches, those uneven things that are happening can suggest things like a facial expression that I was not even planning. I'm really into that. So learn that. Learn to be comfortable with saying yes or no or maybe later while you're sculpting. These shapes are suggesting something. Be smart and listen. Consider at least. You go like, oh, this could be fun. Now the nose area and the snout here has been applied a few minutes ago, so it's already pretty firm. And I can go back and do this sharper 
So I want that nostril to go down and try to meet the tip a little bit. And maybe I want to smooth that out. Maybe I want to, like I said earlier, I might want to pinch that out a little bit. Most of it's still there. I just wanted to get a more diagonal approach for the top of the, the nose that meets the forehead. Now, I might want to add some ears in there. Keep in mind that if you're going to add some really pointy, skinny things, these are the things that will have a tendency to want to break off. So, once again, the importance of anchor first, detail after, or detail later. Pinch really well. Pinch a surf, you know, the, the additional piece into the surface and the surface over the additional piece. That way you're sure that this will not separate if you drop this thing on the floor by mistake of course so those pointy ears should be thick is what i was trying to say earlier i got a bit sidetracked um because if they're not they will be breaking breaking off pretty quick i mean this stuff is super strong but it's got its own limits just like anything else oops <laughs> i put an ear in his eyeball <laughs> this is not an angle that i'm used to sculpting i usually work quite differently but since i'm filming i must try to make it clear for you so if i look a bit clumsy that's because i am but i'm less clumsy than that normally now i'm struggling with um the way that this is shaping so i'm going to use a bit of uh, moisture from the wheat paste onto my fingers and it's going to help me slide a bit this could actually be a time where i go back over the whole thing and start detailing with a lubricated tool lubricated tool with the wheat paste again or a bit of water depending on how fast you want the cellulite to um, smooth out and if you use too much water then it's going to be mush it's not going to be easy to hard to um, control that's why i use wheat paste it doesn't penetrate as fast as water into the you know in, in between the fibers is what i'm assuming but um that's why you can actually work on keep working on it you don't have to wait for it to dry for an hour or two before you could get back to it. Now, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to look like a, a grotesque sculpture, like a gargoyle that doesn't spit water. That's what you call a grotesque. Uh, I like that. I haven't made a gargoyle like or a grotesque uh, sculpture in years. So, yeah, it could become a little uh, luck charm or a little book guardian on your shelf this is so much fun i'd like him to have a bit of an open mouth so i'm going to use my tool in here and i'll pull out a little bit like this and i could go back with a fine fine brush and uh, smooth out the inside if i can find one all right so i want the inside of that mouth to be a bit smoother so i go back with the brush and a little bit of wheat paste can do that with the nostrils as well when this is a bit firmer, I can go back and separate the body parts a little bit. So I want that nose to be part of the snout area because it's kind of a nose snout thing. And I want those folds called the nasal labial fold to continue a little bit past the mouth and frame it. So yeah, you could use a brush to press into it. This is a fine detail brush. That was a bit messed up, so I'm not too afraid of using it in clay or celery clay in this case. But normally, I don't recommend using a soft brush for this. A firmer. It could be a small detail brush that's made to be firm for texturing work, for example. If you use any kind of really soft, brand new brush into pressing into things with it, you're going to ruin the brush. You know That, that tip will, will become really, really frizzled and frazzled. This one was already, so I didn't mind. But keep that in mind. Like a, a soft brush should not be for pushing or stippling. It should always be for gently depositing colors or pushing it around if it's a puddle of water. If you're going to go with thick paints, use a stiff, thick brush. You know, with lots of uh, hair density. They are made for surviving that kind of treatment. So yeah, I'm going back with a brush here. And I'm basically smoothing things out rounding things off a little bit i have more brushes but they're not close to me so i'm gonna i'm just gonna adapt my pressure levels 
to the task. And that's another thing you need to get used to if you want to get more efficient at sculpting, adapt. You don't have that special, perfect, usual tool. Make another one or use something else if you don't have time to look for it, if you can't go to the store, etc. Some things are hard to replace, but at least I think we should try. If only to give us new ideas, you know, oh, this is this was not my solution, but it certainly gives me ideas for another project. So now that it's firmed up quite a bit around the eyes, I'm actually able to go back and gently push and pull and smooth those eyeball shapes into something more oval, more precise. Little push, little slide. Thinking a bit, almost like creating facets on a piece of jewel. You know, one notch here, one notch there. And eventually you have so many notches that it looks more like a circle. Then you smooth it out. So that's how I think about it. Now, this eyeball is a lot smaller than the other one. I might decide to enlarge it or to shorten the other one. Let's shorten it. Let's make it small. So I pinched. I mean, I cut into it. Then I can smooth the other parts around it to become part of the eye socket or the eyebrows. That's much better. This bump here is hiding the eyes a little bit, but I don't hate that. It's a grotesque after all. I can exaggerate things. Maybe they're made like this. Maybe they have this double fold over the nose. That was suggested by the material. So I said yes. You could create major, sorry, major caricatures of, you know, people, creatures, all sorts of things with this approach. It might look a bit flat right now, but the beauty of this is you can come back and add more now or later. If I don't want to disturb this too much, because I love it right now, if I really do, something special about this face, um, I can let it dry and then go back, you know, go back to it later and add those volumes where I want them. And that means I won't have disturbed the other structure that I like so much. And it, it, it also gives you an advantage if you mess up while you're applying a new study clay on top of the dry one. For a little while, you'll still be able to pull it out and start over. So that's another advantage. So with a bit of patience, a bit of planning, not too much, not enough to drive me nuts. Just, you know what? I like this enough that I'm willing to set it aside to dry for a few hours, preferably eight between 8 to 16 hours in front of a fan before I add more definition to it. If you don't want to wait because you're on a deadline, you can still do it right now. So if I want those cheeks to stand out a bit more, like at least the cheekbones, I'm going to take a piece that's about twice the size of what I need, and I'll chop it in half to have the same quantity in both hands. So I got one here, I got one here, and I just boosted the size of these cheekbones almost instantly. Use a bit of uh, wheat paste. I use too much. And I have a cat hair in my eye again. It's like my eyes are magnetic, specifically the cat hair. Now I'm sculpting with just one eye open, so I'll take a short break and be right back. So we have this uh, extra cheekbone that I'm smoothing together. A bit of wheat paste, tiny, tiny amounts. If I add too much, it's going to make a little lump, which is not a big deal, which is annoying. Now I can go back and smooth everything out. Like I'm barely pushing on my tool. I'm using it mostly like a brush, like the brush I was using earlier. And yes, you can go back to the brush for that. But at first, I wanted to really anchor it with the tool because it presses more without distortion. The, the tool does not distort, I mean. The advantage of the brush is that, is that it does adapt to what it's pressed against. So you get those organic irregularities at enough of a frequency that it looks regular or not, depending on how you use it. It's, it's amazing. I love it. It's like, it took me a while to figure out you could use a brush for, for this. And when I did, it blew my mind, it improved my results. I want those nostrils to be a bit more open because they will dry and they will shrink as they dry. So now's a good time to exaggerate a little bit. So you'll see a different look. You'll have a different look when this is dry, a slightly different look. And you got to be okay with that. 
because uh, it will shrink. It will uh, things will be less deep. Some of those edges will become sharper, and some of those details will become duller. That's fine. It's really easy to fix after it's dry. You can add more. You can file it. You can carve it. It's beautiful material. I, to me, this is the equivalent. I think I mentioned that before, but I think it bears repeating. Cellulite is like the watercolor of sculpting. Even though clay itself, in general, is like that, uh, for me it feels more like it has a mind of its own. It likes to behave in a certain way. Once you learn in these ways, you work with them instead of fighting against them and failing. Here's a better angle of our little friend. As you can see, it's very rough. Let's get a bit closer. Very, very rough right now, but the shadows will help me. If I change my lighting conditions a little bit, it helps me see different shapes more sharply. Now you'll, you'll see I did not detail the hands. Those can wait for next time, but already I know that they're there. I have an indication of arms. I could change my mind and move them around later. Even after they're dry, I could cut them out could do them again with more steady clay but so far I like where they are so I might just draw them with the brush or the tool it's probably less stress to use the brush other tool because the brush has bristles you don't want to mess them up too much this is just an, a placeholder like a, a rough sketch of where they are so that next time I know what I was thinking now and maybe smooth out the edges a little bit. You want, you want it to look sculpted, not drawn in. At least I do. I don't know about you. So if it wasn't an actual uh, grotesque, you know, stone sculpture, the ears would not be super skinny in the back because they would be too fragile. They would fall off. So for that, for both reasons of style and durability, I would leave them pretty much filled in in the back. In fact, I would probably add more next time. You see this? There's a little little gap. Oh, there's a little bit of gap here. Uh, let's record this part again. Now, because this is a stone sculpture, or that's what I'm aiming for, that look, if it was made of stone, it would not have like a crazy amount of space between the ears and the head, because that would make the stone too fragile, especially on a building, because, you know, the elements would erode it too much. So this I really want to anchor properly right now and make sure there's no air pocket between the added cellulite and what was already there. But I also will um, add a tiny bit more to really stabilize it and not be worried about that fragility happening. And when it's dry, you can always add more. Right now, this whole thing is very thick in places, especially the ears and the nose and the arms. But that's fine. Let it dry long enough in front of the fan. Use the poking method to let that moisture escape faster it's gonna look like garbage at first with all these dots but yeah it's super easy to fill with that next application you may want to start with filling these holes with the slurry of it by a slurry i mean you um you can mix a bit more water or paste into your cellulite make it a bit more liquid and that will allow you to easily patch those holes faster but yeah i don't even bother with making a slurry normally i just Add those holes. I mean, I fill those holes with the with the already mixed fern mix. I don't sculpt with a super slushy mix. I will use the slushy mix to texture things, but I will not use it for um, trying to create volumes because that would be counterproductive. It would just it would droop a down. Years ago, before I knew how to sculpt volumes into cellulite without it drooping down. I asked for advice, you know, I asked several artists for advice and the best piece of advice was to mix it firmer and wait for the cellulite clay to get firmer as you sculpt. Like it will go through different stages of firmness. You know, it gets firmer for a few, maybe for an hour or two. Then you probably don't want to touch it because it's going to get a little bit weird. But for the first few minutes, at least for the first few hour, for the first hour, 
you can go back and keep refining it and control your pressure control your pressure and I'm combining all these advice for you in one place so I can't start naming where everything came from because I don't remember the the most insightful um, source of these pieces of advice was definitely Ronnie Burkett he was generous with answering all my questions years ago about this when I I, I hit a wall I, at first I was not yet in full uh, understanding of how cellular works and I was getting worried that I would not be so I wrote to him and I asked and he said a lot of things that allowed me to try again and actually get results so you wait for the cellulite to firm up as you work like you I'm working this area right now because it's already firmed up I can feel it work differently than what I just applied in the back of the ear for example so it could be 10 minutes it could be a half hour but if you go with a very gentle touch and you keep buffing and pushing and smoothing out and digging in and pressing and pinching you could do this whole sculpture in one sitting at least all the shapes of it all the volumes of it that you think you need and it's just that at some point you'll have to stop because the clay will have become i don't want to say brittle because it's not but it's going to want to move around too much if you keep working on it if you keep pushing and pressing right now it's got a little bit of elasticity to it which allows us to keep moving it but eventually it will start cracking not in a dry cracking way more like hey you just pushed me to my limits of where i want to stay so you know you pay the price so that's what you want to you want to start before that happens so yep it does look like i'm scared of uh, sculpting hands on it and i am but let's try here let's try sculpting hands on it so i'm not an expert at sculpting hands even though hands and faces is what i've been doing for years i always struggle with hands but that's okay because i always eventually succeed at making them work for what i need so here's a shortcut to make hands that i use sometimes you make a lump that's got the general shape of your hand like closed fists first or flat you know flat hand depending on the pose you're after stabilize them anchor first detail after now if this was a grotesque sculpture like a gargoyle that doesn't spit water it could be symmetrical like i'm doing now but if I want it to be a, a lot more interesting, I'm going to work more um, asymmetry into it. So, I don't know. I like the classic idol look of movie props where things are pretty symmetrical. I, the two hands might intertwine. And that's the bit that's a little bit more interesting. But right now, it could be holding a prop or something. I see this little lump here. It could be a tail or the beginning of one. The very first gargoyle I sculpted, no, sorry, the second one, had a an S-shaped tail that came out of his back and stayed put with it. Kind of like um, an architectural decoration piece on a piece of molding, you know, wood molding. And how about doing that here? And yeah, you can go crazy detailed like that. But <laughs> I see what's happening here. My mind was getting uncomfortable with the hands and it tried to move me away from them. You see that? Heh, <laughs> discipline. Try to get some. You know, it's hard, I know. But I read somewhere that it's really smart to, especially in arts, you got something you got a problem with, like you, you're, finding, you're finding it difficult, do a lot of that very thing until you get comfortable with it. So... You think hands are hard to draw or, or sculpt? Draw or sculpt a whole lot of hands for a while. Just that. Focus on that for a while. And you'll get better at those. Much faster than if you just did a hand here and a hand there. Whenever you gather the courage. Okay. This arm is a better definition than the other one. So let's try to fix that. So I got this here. Up there. Really want to think about where my elbows are. Here. 
my problems. I don't, I have not had the time to study precise anatomy, like accurate stuff for years because I've been busy making things that did not require that much precision because they're usually covered with fabric, like costumes or fur, the puppets I make. That sounds like an excuse, it is. <laughs> it's just, hey, you gotta pay the bills. So, but I really want to take a break and just study anatomy because it will help in everything I do. Drawing, painting, sculpting, definitely sculpting. So, in fact, if you learn enough about anatomy, you can sculpt your own references. You want a specific character at different angles, you do it. You sculpt it and then you draw it from observation. That's a more complete, I think, approach of understanding. There you go. Now, those hands, if they were a primitive uh, looking or a more rough looking hand, you could just have lines scored into them to start with, and then they can be rounded or blocked out later. That certainly is the kind of the kind of shortcut I used when I first started sculpting, and those instincts can be good. Like they call it beginner's luck sometimes, but you don't have enough preconceived ideas, so you try whatever feels right, and some of those things end up working really well. They might become an integral part of what you do for the rest of your career or hobby. Just because you're not paid for it doesn't mean it's not valid art. The opposite can also be true. <laughs> Let's not debate that now. So we got this with very rough looking fingers. I really like the fatter middle finger here. I'm going to add that to the other one. See, I was not planning that. It happened. I paid attention. It gave me something that's better than what I might have designed on paper because it just happened and i liked it again anchor before you detail i see this piece is moving around too much squish down squish 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 and then bring it back that gap is now almost non-existent and the finger will be very strong by the way these are uh, blocky fingers can be rounded later once they're dry you can file them around if you want with a tiny diamond coated riffler or engraving bits I, I use the engraving bits i put them on a handle a handle like this but the kind that has a tiny hole in the middle and they become little files if i don't want to use the power tool with them because the power tool is hard to get super fine detail with because it's a huge handle i don't have a miniature one yet so I went with the hand tool version of it. It works. It takes, it takes a longer time, but at least you don't tend to, at least I don't tend to remove too much too fast because it's tough enough. <laughs> remove a little, little bit. So it, 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 it allows you to, to fine tune things a bit better. Now you'll see that he's got no neck. And I don't have a problem with that for this guy. I might decide to add a neck later when it's all dry on my second session. Let's go with that tail I had in mind earlier. Another way to anchor this thing better, especially if once the clay has become a little bit more firm, is to score the surface. Now I got that trick from hanging out with a ceramic artist. And they were, you know, it's water-based clay, so you can score both surfaces if they're both firm-ish, and then put a bit of uh, water, or in this case, wheat paste, to become like a slurry between them. It acts like a mechanical bond and probably a, a chemical one, like a combination of both. Oh, this will not separate after I do this, after I pinch it together. Now it's one more mass, one big mass, one big mass too. And when I pinch and move it around, it won't have a tendency to rip out anymore. So that's the general shape of my tail. I might add more. Another way to anchor is just to pinch it. Now this cell clay in the bowl is getting really, really firm. So now might be a time to add more water by spraying. 
once in a while, if you're going to have an open bowl like this, it's a good idea to re-moisten your clay once in a while and knead it back in. I'm just about to finish for today's episode, so I'm not going to bother too much. I will re-moisten it before I store it in a tight, tightly closed container. This time I will put it in the fridge, because the last batch I made, I wasted. Because I left it out for two weeks. Actually, one week. One week, and uh, was, there was a start of a moldy smell. So this time I'm gonna restore it as I need to sometimes by adding hot water to the mix, as I mentioned in a previous episode. So that's the shape of my tail. But now I'd like to dig into there, make like a space, but I might not want to make it an actual space. Maybe later when it's dry, I can drill it out and make it an actual space. But in the meantime, I might just want to sculpt a little bit of a dent in there. Sometimes I like to use a bit of extra cellu clay or any kind of clay that I use at the time. I want to keep a small quantity of it handy. Some people use it on their hands like this. And I was thinking that that could be a good thing to get used to, but I haven't yet. So what I've been doing over time is I put it on a, a smoother, simpler area of the sculpture and pick it out when I need it. Which is a supply thing. Now the tail is getting there. It's getting to be to have a bit of definition. I know my previous one that I referred to earlier had uh, that effect of the tail, you know, it starts at the base and it curls out again. So I might squish that in a little bit. I'm thinking about it like a snake. Tail is snake shaped, snake like. And I might want to, you know, remove the excess clay here to get like a neck effect. Back of the neck, a little wrinkle or. Maybe he's got a mullet. <laughs> Maybe he's got a bunch of plates there. I don't know yet. But I want to make sure that the tail is separate from the body. So I'm pinching the details. That's another way. It's like carving wood without actually removing anything. Or barely anything. Pressing it in. It will compress quite a bit. And when this clay is more stable, I can go back and round it, round it out even better. But if I'm gentle right now, I can actually keep going. I like the tails of my, the bases of my tails to be fatter. That's where the, they're anchored to the body, especially for a chubby character like this. I like them to taper down a bit. So the tip is a lot thinner than the base. I said a bit, but I mean a lot. Press, press, think about faces again, little facets, like think about a cartoon diamond so you can see it in your mind. It's like, I wish I could show you a better example of that, but well, actually I'll show you here. You want to make a, a circle and you don't, you can't roll it in your hands, for example. So you'll take that lump here and maybe anchor it first, of course. Heck, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I'm used to it so much. So I, I've anchored the sides of it at least. And now I want to make it more like a sphere. So I'm going to go face, 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 face. And then you do more faces until the whole thing looks more, you know, smaller, smaller faces, more numerous, until the whole thing looks a lot rounder. When the clay firms up, you can go back and shape it even sharper if you need even rounder, you can turn that into a horn. I actually like the look of that on his face right now. So I'm going to move it to a more convenient spot for my idea of a horn. I want them to be stubby horns this time instead of tiny pointy ones. So I'm going to put one here. And I'll keep it rough because I want to put the other one there, make them look pretty much the same. So if I had planned ahead, I would have made a bigger ball that's about twice the size of one horn. And I would have chopped it in half. Like this one is much bigger now, so I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna try to eyeball it a bit smaller. And if I have to, I'll enlarge the other one. I kind of like the diagonal on this one, so maybe I'll listen to it, suggest what it wants to be. Anchor it again before you detail. Like anchor it deep. It's going to look ridiculous at first, but then you can pinch it back into the shape you wanted. 
It does a call back to the shape of the ear, which I like. But I might decide to make them much fatter than the ears, or much smaller. I like contrast. Make things interesting. Anchor. Now, am I symmetrical? Not exactly. I might push it around until it is. I know I'm missing clay right now, so I'm going to get a bit of a pinch here. Anchor first, detail later. I believe I have shown you the foundations of shaping with cellular clay, all those that I use anyways. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I'm very happy to have been able to show you this because I have not seen many people create details into cellular clay. I have seen some amazing work made that way, but not many, not by many people. So to see that technique now available at large is very motivating to me because I know it can be done. I have seen, I have done this for years. It's exciting to see how strong the results are for something like this. You can, of course, make money with this. It can be just a very, very satisfying and therapeutic hobby. But it's going to open up a whole lot of doors for you. In fact, now I can't stop. This is something that's so satisfying. Like this little body now reminds me of a squirrel. So I need to add little squirrel-like feet grabbing at the base. And that's my warning to you. If you start doing a test like this, you might end up loving it more than what you were planning to do. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Uh, you decide if you want to stick with that, if you want to risk it. So why am I doing all this? Is because anchor first, detail later. Did I repeat that enough? Will you remember, remember that for the rest of your days? Hopefully. Because for any kind of clay, I think that's a wiser way to work. Because you won't have as much of that lifting problem. Because everything is one one piece now whether it's regular water-based clay air dry water-based clay ceramic clay polymer clay anchor it first detail after now i made this these two lumps with a with a line with a line in the middle but i'd like them to have more that that look like it's grabbing at things so i want at least three sections so i, I have the section here for the foot itself that's partially hidden by the belly so it's coming from underneath the belly. I might want to indicate that a little bit. And then I might want to start knowing where the fingers, oh, this is getting a little bit messy. I should have a bit of a, I do have a bowl of water next to me now. I just forgot about it. So yeah, I want to draw those lines. Like this is where the, the toes are starting on both sides. Then I have a joint here, and that means if there's a joint, there's, there's this part and this part. So I want to start facing it. I want to give it a nice flat geometric structure like I did the fingers, even though those fingers could have been a little bit more oriented, but that's fine. I can keep things simple. Again, face face. I can round them off later. Right now what I'm concerned about is the direction of them. I was not planning on going this deep on this piece, but I love it. So sorry, little, uh, little goblin, uh, you have been replaced. <laughs> you have become a handle. But yeah, sometimes you make those decisions. So yeah, we got this uh, cute creation done in you know, less than an hour. The rest of it will just be finishing work. Now, do I give him three claws? I think two is enough. Not claws, but talons. Two is enough for the bottom. Now, this base he's on, what is it? Is it a stone? Because that could be fun. Could be fun to design. But if I were, I would probably clamp it onto a, a vice so that I don't have to hold it so close to it. 
but yes I can go back and uh, give it more of a you know less of a stock of wood type of angle because there's still some remnants of it and create more of a rock look so add more forgot to add this paste there could be water we all have paste it's fine I prefer paste it does slide a bit more at first but then it anchors really well so I do like my bases to be a bit wide so they provide more stability but this guy could actually have another base underneath the rock that he's standing on so that's not a really big problem I just want to eliminate the flat face here which could actually be done by carving when the celly clay is dry but uh, it's easier this way it's gotta be more organic a big boulder look a boulder look for a boulder pun intended so we got a need for more paste for smoothing you'll see that the wood is visible in some spots I like that shape so I'll keep it just because you know those little imperfections these unexpected changes it just makes things look more natural at least to me you look at a really nice rock outside get, get a closer look you might see some little things that might be considered defects or imperfections or damage that's what makes it what it is is the story of where that stone has been what has happened to it you'll see that there's a lump here on this side more than the other I like that a lot so I'll add more wasn't thinking of doing that it just happened and now I look smarter because people might think if they were not listening to this oh, he planned everything I planned almost nothing <laughs> I just went with it those feet especially I'm like what I was just making a quick test I was gonna rip out later but I haven't had this much fun improvising a character straight into Cellucleae for a while because I have not been working with Cellucleae that much recently which I regret because I love it so I've been working with other projects on other projects it always depends on the commissions that I'm you know hired to do so if Sally Clay is going to be the best for that project, then I'll use it. And it's usually the best for most of my paper mache projects because it's either a good texture or a good structure or both. So I kind of panic if I run out. Like if I look like I'm going to run out, I'm going to quickly order more. In fact, I probably should right now. I have a ton, but it's these days shipping takes forever. So I don't want to run out ever again. This is looking good. I don't think the stone is finished yet, but it's giving me that look enough that I'll be able to remember that that's what it is. That plate in the back of the neck, not a big fan of it. So either turn it into hair or just remove it altogether. Hmm. Remove it. I know I said yes a lot during this whole session, but I'm going to say no to this. Oops, you can see the wood. That's not a problem. I'm going to let this dry and I'm going to carve out that spot. That spot. Or I could make the back of the head bigger to compensate and then add as much celly clay there as I want. Do I want to make the back of the head bigger? I do not. So I will just carve the wood out, file it round to make it merge in shape with the celly clay and maybe even add a bit of silicone clay on top later to finalize the look yeah there's a little lump of paste in there but it looks like a fang and I like it so I'm going to remove it because that's not strong by itself I'm going to make a little tooth indication with a tiny bit probably should roll it first now if you roll a piece of silicone clay in your hands long enough it will dry out it will uh, become firmer at least that's a way to use it you could also use little objects like a toothpick toothpick you could uh, chop off with a pair of pliers you could chop off the, the end of a toothpick and poke it in and it could create a really really nice sharp fang but this will be enough for now if I don't like it I can always carve it out later but it tells me there's a fang at least and I want one on the other side oh we got some uh, semi-dry clay here that could be served could serve as 
a fang. Now you could prepare these in advance. You could make a whole bunch of fangs. Make a whole tray of them. And let them dry. And later you'll have them to integrate them into a sculpture. Into a wet silly clay sculpture. There you go. Sorry for uh, going out of frame a lot today. I still getting used to not seeing my monitor when I'm sculpting. Yeah. This guy is taking over the channel and I'm okay with that. <laughs> he was not planned, but he's a happy, happy birth. I'm really happy with what he's looking like already and I'm excited to see what he becomes. So we're going to use this one a whole lot more than anything else to show how sharp we can bring the cellulite products over time. So let's dry this in front of a fan for a few days. I'm going to take the time to poke him with a little teep in like I showed earlier to make sure the moisture gets out faster. But I'll wait for a day before I do that. I don't want to risk him at all. So I don't want to risk the structure of him. So I'm going to wait until there's a skin that's dry on top of the cellulite and then I'll poke tiny, tiny holes and um, dry it further. And next week, I want to talk about how I dry these things more specifically with heat. I don't use heat until the paper product already feels dry. The heat is a precaution and an advantage as well. But if you use it too early, you're going to get distortions and shrinkage, which can be good if you're making things like zombies and corpses and wounds and stuff like that. Like you want to be a bit random or distorted. So break the rules when you want to, but know them first. So this is what happen what's happening this week as uh, we wait for the next episode. This guy will dry. The other examples will dry too. And I'll mostly work on this guy from now on, hopefully, because... I think it's important to see the, the evolution of from rough to refined textures. So leave your comments in the section. Leave your questions in, this, in the comments section and I'll answer those. I can see if you have any pictures of what you've been doing with Cellucle. I'd love to see that. And if you give me permission, I might actually do a special episode at some point where we can share those results with the public and maybe I can do a review or a, what's it called a critique give some advice based on what we see if you're up for that it's very uh, rewarding uh, I've had my work um, constructive criticized like this before and it always taught me something really deep about what I was doing and how I could do it better so if you're open to that if you want to be our guinea pig for that I might pick one or two or three people and that would be awesome so are you game are you, do you want to participate? Let me know. So um, I also offer online training, one-on-one, -on -one, online. So Skype, Zoom, something else. It could also be a more public thing. We can do that on Twitch, where I already am streaming regularly. You could become the sponsor of that specific stream. I'd be teaching to you specifically with your questions, but the public could interact in the chat. So keep, keep, think about that. See you next week when we do some refining work on this using different methods, including... Carving, filing, sanding, burning, and buffing, and adding more clay, of course. See you then. Thank you for watching, and keep on being creative. Bye.